Hello, Mike here from uh, John Mike's Virtual Tours of uh, Scotland and you can hear the bell striking three o'clock. We're in here, the wee red tune as they call it, of uh, Kiri Muir and we're doing our usual live tour. So thank you once again for coming on board, thanks for sharing, for liking and remember all our tours again are going on to YouTube. So I'm going to be filming today, so I'm going to go behind the camera but feel free to ask questions. I'm just going to introduce a local historian who is Dave Orr, and uh, here he is. Hello folks, welcome to Kerry Muir. Uh, it's a lovely afternoon here today and we're going to be taking a, a wee walk around the town and seeing some of the history and uh, telling you some of the stories about how the town originated and uh, some of the people that uh, lived here in the past. So I think we'll start by going across to the square and uh, have a look at the, the townhouse museum and uh, Maybe see uh, uh, the statue of Peter Pan, which is probably what the town is most famous for. Uh, so we're getting that gathering an international audience, Dave. We've already got the uh, folk from Canada coming on board at the moment. So uh, we ha feel free again, folks, to ask questions as we go around. So we're just going to follow Dave on his uh, guided tour. If there's any issues with sound or anything, again, uh, just feel free to comment. But hopefully all is uh, going well. Well, we're just passing the uh, townhouse, which is now, it's had many uses. It's been a chemist, a police station, uh, a jail. It was the uh, uh, court, borough courthouse, and uh, it's had uh, many, many uses over the years. But it's the uh, county's oldest uh, building still in occupation, built in the 1600s, uh, the earliest part, although, as you can see, it's had uh, many modifications um, uh, over the years. I think traffic finds, well, modern traffic finds it a hard yes. time in Kerry yes. Muir because uh, it wasn't really designed for cars very much. So uh, <laughs> um, we just had a question if Joe's with us today, but no, Joe's on holiday. I believe he's in London today, but he'll be joining us on Wednesday as usual when we go to Arms. Okay. We're just crossing into the heart of the town now and so, heading up towards the, the Peter Pan statue. Just a wee question about the this uh, townhouse, this uh, toll booth, what, what, what would it have been used for, Dave, do you say? Uh, well, it, it, it's, yeah. it's had many uses over the years. Um, before it was converted to a museum, latterly, it was a chemist's shop. Uh, but before that, uh, it had uh, many uses, and uh, including the, the borough court, which was held in the upper floor. Uh, when it was a, the police station in the borough court, the, the basement uh, was actually the prison. and. Uh, Many stories about the prisoners being fed through the open bars. It had been a fairly grim place to be uh, bezeled. But the, the, where the, the door on the right is, you can see the alterations. And it had formerly steps up uh, to the first floor directly from the, the ground there. But you can see the, uh, a later door has been inserted there. And where the cobbles are in front of the, the building, it was the, what they called the plain stains. And that's where people would have uh, sat and sold their vegetables and eggs. They would have come in from the country on market day and sold their eggs and uh, goods from the, the countryside to the, the people of the town. The square itself was actually a market square on market days and cattle uh, would have been found uh, wandering around the streets. But as you can see there are only a few narrow entrances so it would be quite easy to block them off and various other traders would have had market stalls surrounding the square. Um, Kerry Muir is unusual in that it's not a linear form, it's basically a, a series of squares linked by small lanes, alleys, or as we call them locally, closes. And uh, it's quite unusual in that. So you can see here there's really two squares, uh, the, 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 squ the main one here, and then uh, beyond you see the other square uh, in front of which, which was, a, a, well, in fact there were two large hotels, the, the tallest building in Kerry Muir is the four-storey building uh, just across the square and that was a commercial hotel and uh, the one behind with the, the more ornate stone work uh, was the Ogilvy Arms Hotel, Ogilvy being uh, one of the local names. Uh, this is basically the land of the Ogilvies uh, who were uh, natural uh, enemies or 
combatants with the Lindsays, <laughs> who were uh, slightly more to the east of Kirimuir. When, when you mention a linear uh, threat up, uh, Dave, um, I think people are familiar with the mercantile layout of Edinburgh, where you've got this big long street and all the little streets are closest coming off it. Yeah. Um, I think uh, perhaps this is quite even, a big contrast here, yeah. Even, even, even within yeah. Angus, most of the, the towns are a, that linear concept, and Forfar and Arbroath and Troes are very much of that uh, concept. But no, here in Kirimu it's all quite small uh, squares. Uh, it may be unbelievable to some folk, but there was actually a, a building uh, situated between where uh, you see the cooperative on the other side and the, the uh, ironmongers here, there was a building sitting there. So you can imagine how narrow the, the, the accesses uh, were on each side of that street. But that was removed in the uh, early 1900s just to allow traffic to, to free flow. The name uh, Kerry Muir, I think some folk may wonder uh, what does it mean? Uh, maybe if you'd like to give us some idea well, of what that comes from. The Kerry Muir itself, um, uh, it was on Pont's map uh, in the 1590s, it was, it was shown as Kerry Muir, but uh, even in the, the Great Seal, uh, there were 36 variants of the spelling of the name Kerry Muir. The meaning of the name really falls into two camps. It either means uh, part of the Great Quarter or it means uh, the Church of Mary from the, the Gallic Kill, if it's Kill, Killy Moor. Um, but so uh, it's, it's, it's undefined as to what the, the, the true meaning of the, the, the name is. When you see um, a great quarter, what, what's, is that something to do with land division? Or? Yes, land yeah, division. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the county of what is now Angus, uh, what was previously Forfarshire, uh, was really divided into four supposedly equal parts, but Kerry Muir, for it being one of the smallest boroughs now, uh, it contained a, a large portion of the county and extended as far down as uh, Dundee and Money Feath, parts of that. So I think that's where the physical size of the Great Quarter was rather than necessarily population. It's really but, beautiful too with this red sandstone. Um, so uh, we've got this um, the statue uh, here in the middle, and uh, it's got a connection with a very famous uh, character and a very famous author, J.M. Uh, Barry. So, I'd like to maybe say something about the, the statue, Dave. I know it wasn't really always here, was it? it wasn't no, the, the original statue uh, was commissioned by the Angus Milling Company. Uh, mm -hmm. It was part of their logo, they, they traded under the name Peter Pan. Uh, selling uh, you know, porridge oats under that name. Um, but because it was became famous uh, in front of their um, uh, milling works uh, f elsewhere in the town, uh, it became quite famous and uh, following damage uh, to the original one, which was fiberglass, this uh, bronze statue was recommissioned uh, by the, the, the sculptor um, and uh, it was then decided to be moved here. It was a a chap called Alexander Smart who designed the, the sculpture and it's supposedly based on uh, the model of his own son but it certainly uh, perpetuates the, the sort of the, the belief that many people have of the little boy who never grew up made famous by Barry and his, his stories. Uh, the, sta the statue base is quite interesting, it features some of the other characters um, uh, on the, the feature in his stories with little faces and uh, snakes and uh, things in the, that he tells in the stories. Yeah, these are, these are some of the things that a lot of people tend to miss, you know, when you're, you're looking at stuff, there's some really hidden details there. I can get right in there. You, and, if you come uh, round the back, you'll see little faces and uh, spiders and snakes. Yeah. Uh, that was so smart. He was actually one of my lecturers uh, at art college back in the day. I think he's passed on now, but um, he uh, was very detailed, as you can see. He was one of these sculptors who was quite realist. In fact, I think there's a wee, which I haven't actually seen myself, where uh, Dave's just drawn my attention to little heads and things sneaking out of the greenery, things that look like green men or something in there. So it's, uh, it's the, quite a lot of detail. Yeah, yeah. The, the, there are a number of Peter Pan statues uh, all over the world. Um, I mean, the most famous one, of course, being in, in London, 
which uh, J.M. Barry unveiled as a surprise for the children. But uh, they're all over the world. They're in Canada and Australia and what have you. And there's the famous story of the, the one in uh, Belgium uh, during the, the Second World War when some of the resistance groups started publishing uh, some uh, local stories and uh, they always signed them, Peter Pan, Egremont Park, which of course when the Nazis tried to find them, uh, of course they, they came along and found a statue standing in the park. Oh right, right. <laughs> but, uh, Shall we go around and have a look at some of the narrow closes and uh, Yeah, yeah, some great of the idea. I came. saw a guy out uh, tending the the flowers in here. Uh, just uh, it's just quite a decorative um, feature here in the square. But yeah, yeah, we'll just uh, move away from the square into some of the more hidden areas, uh, some of the back areas. Yeah, the Vasokis, Dave. Yes, uh, it's a. Uh, is this an old history the, with this family? Yes, I, yeah, the, yeah. the Zoki family were there for uh, about 80 years. It still trades under the, the name, but it was a, an Italian immigrant family who came across uh, and set up uh, an ice cream parlour. The building you see today uh, originally was a, a small um, ice cream parlour on the right-hand side, and the larger part of the building was actually the town cinema. Oh, wow. Uh, it right. was actually <laughs> the, the, the Regal yeah. Cinema, but the... The Vizoki family ran the, the cinema as well. Uh, they were a, a very well-known and well-liked family in the town and the, the name has obviously been preserved uh, by the current uh, traders. Uh, and that's Billy's Bray, um, is the pub where there's music every Tuesday. There hasn't been during Covid, but I'm hoping to get in there and play some uh, acoustic music on Tuesday evening. Yeah, But notice also you've got all this wonderful detail in the paving as well yeah so the, the if you start from this end you'll be able to read right, the, we'll get the the history of the the town it was famous for uh, weaving jute and a a, a local uh, lady mary mackintosh oh. uh wrote the, the these lines here uh, I'll, I'll just read it to you if you you like and you'll get it in the local yeah. vernacular yes um, oh, you, it, it says in the how then tune hear the ghosts of the webster shuttle clacking back and forth it Back and for it, warp the weft, weft the warp. And that's from a poem that she wrote called Webster's Lay. Webster's were the, is the local name for the weavers uh, for which the town is famous. Uh, it was uh, mainly handloom weavers in the early days until industrialisation and then Kerry Muir had the, the two factories, the Gary factory and J&D Wilkie's factory. Uh, sadly, the Gary factory no longer uh, produces anything, but the G&D Wilkie's factory go from strength to strength and they're uh, still installing new looms uh, even as we speak. Well, that's good to know. And I, I know from 1860 was when uh, Jim Barry, the author of Peter Pan, was born. It says there was about 1,500 hand loom weavers here in Kerrymuir and about 500 in the outlying areas. Yeah. That's right. And yeah. the handloom weavers would uh, bring the, the cloth up to the town to be stamped to make sure that it was, uh, the quality was of the correct uh, standard. And uh, they would bring it here to the townhouse to be stamped. And uh, clearly if it failed, it, uh, it was destroyed, which would be a great loss to the, the weavers. We're looking I'm, just at the... a, I'm just taking a view of curry muir cuisine there. It's a very clever... Um... <laughs> <laughs> yes, a another variant of Curry Muir, so the name continues to develop. <laughs> and that's the back of the, the toll booth that's all this amazing stonework. Uh, this is old red sandstone, yes. uh, which is the local... You can, you can see the variant in the, where the doors and the windows have been blocked up on the ground floor as its various uses have uh, moved on from year to year. And we'll go around the, the back and you can see the... It's very unforgiving, that stone, it, uh, you know, with weathering. I always have to keep an eye on it. Well, the house I've got has got that same stone. But you've got all these nice little pens and alleyways and but, so on. And back. The colour of the stone is really where yeah. the, uh, the name, the wee red tune, comes from. It's the, the, the red sandstone, which is uh, all around us here. Yeah. And we're now going into Kirkwind. This is a, the, the church is central to the town of Kerrymuir. It developed around the church uh, in its earliest days. And the early Pictish... Uh, religious settlements were all on a sort of built on an oval design and as we look along uh, this kirk wind it truly does wind round the, the the street here is this uh, does this house actually date to 
the 17th century, or is that um, the, 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 the buildings would date to that uh -huh. period. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the stone is a, a replacement that was uh, put there uh, in 2008. It was uh, recarved by uh, a local uh, uh, stonemason uh, because the stone uh, became damaged uh, uh, through a, an accident uh, and uh, it was uh, damaged and beyond repair. So we had a commission a new one to be done in the, the Heritage Trust, which is why there's a, a symbol above it. There's a, a town trail which uh, uh, tells the story of the town, which can, is obtained from the, the local museum. And you can do a self-tour of the town using the, the town trail, well, which to give, gives yeah. these uh, signs. Again, uh, being Kerry Muir, we used the logo of Peter Pan as the, as the standard image. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we're we'll coming to Kirkwind here, and uh, this is quite unusual, a, a flat arch. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, can't, you don't find many of them anywhere in no. the country. A great skill in building. We'll need to watch for this car, anyway. Yeah. Um, but you'll see another flat arch here. If you, if you look around, I, I was describing the, the curvature uh, of the Kirkwind and how that uh, was how the uh, original Pictish uh, sites were. They were, a, if you can imagine, an oval. So the, the town was built on a, uh, a flat area, although it's all very hilly. The centre part of the town, as you can see, is quite level, and that was the site that was chosen for the site of the early church, which is replaced, obviously, by the more modern building that you see today. But yeah, you can, can see, see the, the curvature, curvature, of, the curvature on of the buildings. The, the buildings. Yeah. Uh, so many of these yeah. will date uh, certainly to the 17th century. Mm -hmm. And if we go through the pen, we'll go down to. Another feature of Kerry Muir, which is uh, one of the uh, narrowest streets. In fact, it is the narrowest uh, public thoroughfare anywhere in Britain. Uh, it's a, a very little known uh, uh, bend or close, and uh, unsurprisingly, it's called the Cat's Close. <laughs> right. So we'll go down here and. Uh, so you're in the back area here, and it's uh, quite picturesque, isn't it? It's, uh, some nice houses here, some really old structures as well. Yeah, but satellite dishes yep, there, yep. which very much uh, 21st century as well. <laughs> oh, and there's a place for sale. Oh, there you go. <laughs> if, you look if you look beyond the street, you'll see the, the, the exit from the town going up the, the brae there. Yeah. Um, and that, that leads up to uh, the, the window in Thrums which was a, a small window in the cottage at the top of the hill, uh, which is where Barry came up with the idea uh, for his, uh, his uh, story of the, the people of Kirimuir. He envisaged this small attic window looking out over the town, and of course he recognised the, the town from that point and could give details of the people that he knew and tell various stories, some of which may be imaginary, but uh, I'm sure many of them were based on the real characters. So you can still get some nice views of the local landscape around um, uh, the development. New developments seem not to have been that huge in terms of uh, in the center, spoiling the views. It's got some really nice aspects, yeah. Yeah, yeah. in the centre it's, uh, yeah. it's fairly traditional. The building we're here at the moment is part of the old weaving shed. This would have been uh, part of the weaving uh, where, uh, the, for the factory, uh, which is... Uh, just below us here, but I promised you to take you through the cats close, so that's where we'll go now. Yeah, the, we'll and see this. This is uh, a bit of a record in terms of you're saying this is the narrowest at, at, at 40 centimeters. This is the narrowest public thoroughfare in Britain. So, if we lose you, don't worry, folks, we'll be back. <laughs> I think we should still get a signal though. There we go. Wow, this is when I need to feel that I go on a diet, Dave, you know. <laughs> Um, let's go. <laughs> right, here yes. we go. Oh, that's amazing. It's really nice. You're less than 40 centimetres. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to swing, swing us around again, just have a look at that from the other side. And you've got all the slate, which of course is typical, isn't it? The grey slate. And there's yes, and the... you'll see on the, that roof there, that all the windows are on the north side, because for weaving, oh, you only right, wanted yeah. the north light. So there, that narrow, that is so easy to miss, the cat's close. Right. You need a local like uh, Dave here to get to places like that. These are very much hidden gems of the main drag, if you like. And uh, we've got the sun today as well, which is great. Nice bit of uh, sunshine, a bit of warmth as well. So. 
we're into another area here which, um, you know, uh, although it's now a lovely garden area, uh, at one time this was a, a local smithy, so the blacksmiths would have been working in this area. Wow. Oh yes, it's lovely garden. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful, yeah, yeah. We are doing a live tour. You're, you're live to the we world. Are international <laughs> audience. We are admiring your garden, it's beautiful. Yes. <laughs> Nicely kept lawns there as well. Right. Yeah, so weaving, that, uh, that was uh, linen, I believe, and there's something about the uh, double well, width brown linen. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, double width and uh, Osnaburg linen, which probably is more famous in Forfar, but uh, Osnaburg was the, the rough uh, linen, uh, which was exported. And that, uh, I believe that went into corsets. I read somewhere, yep. <laughs> corsets and stiffening that, of uh, fabrics. That may, that may be an expertise, <laughs> which I'm not aware of. <laughs> No, we're, we're back here in the, the Kirkwine. The, the wall uh, behind me here is the, the wall of the local graveyard. And uh, so the, you see the graves uh, inside there in the, the churchyard. The church is behind that lovely copper beach. We're getting some really good comments here saying uh, great storytelling, great tour. So they're all enjoying it. Again, you can see this area, his buildings have been removed. Uh, and just to create car parking because it's it's so narrow. There's really very it's very difficult to drive around here and get find a parking space. So what would these recesses be? Well, they, they were obviously part of this house. If you oh, look right. on the gable yeah. end, you'll see the oh, the I gable see end. It. You see the three-story house that had been there, and so obviously these were cupboards, windows, and doors, which mm -hmm. would all have looked right out onto the the graveyard. Mm -hmm. The chap who built the the big block. Um, he got permission from the church to demolish the buildings that were there and replace it with this uh, large block of flats. Uh, and he managed to encroach onto the, the graveyard by just taking the wall away and incorporating it into the pounds of his uh, new building. Right, and the fireplace is like the remains of a fireplace. Yes, uh, you can see the three fireplaces there, so it oh, shows yeah. the, the heights sizes, of the doors. Yeah. And again, there had been cupboards. Uh, and other doorways there, you still see the, the timber lintels in place. This man's a surveyor, uh, Dave, here as well as being a historian, so he's been able to interpret things that I just would not have a clue about. So it's great, it's very really good. And we're coming round to the, the back of the building, the uh, lovely old uh, wooden bridge between the two buildings. Again, quite oh, an no. unusual yeah, feature. Yeah, I see that. Uh, this was to link the offices uh, on one side of the street to the offices on the other side of the street. Um, it's that funny come upon that, you know, because you're in a residential bit in the back areas and then suddenly there's a solicitors and you're back on the main street. Yes. <laughs> the, the solicitors yeah. building here, uh, yeah. this was originally a, a, bake, uh, a bakehouse. Uh -huh. uh, this was yeah. Scott's Bakehouse uh, back in uh, 19... Certainly in 1913, up to the First World War, um, and the, the actual bakery building was down the back. The ovens uh, were down on that back wall down there, where there's an open area with washing drying now. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, the, the, this building has now been converted to a cafe, um, but uh, they did uh, preserve the name, and uh, you'll see it as we come out here. It's uh, now called Bridges. And there was a water here, there was, uh, is it the Geary? Or the, Geary the, Geary, the Geary Burn is yeah. at, the, at the foot of the hill, yeah. uh, right throughout the town. This, this is a, an interesting building, it's had many uses as well. And uh, the building here, uh, uh, that is now used by the solicitors, uh, whilst it was a, a, a bakehouse and a bakery at one time, it was also uh, the Waybridge, the first public Waybridge, and the Waybridge actually sat here, and they would bring the horses. This was the main entrance to the town uh, from its earliest days right through uh, to when the station, and although it's called Marywell Bray now, and that hints to the origins of the name of the town, St Mary, uh, and St Mary's Well is just down there on the left, but right at the bottom of the hill, um, 
just beyond the buildings that you can see is where the, the station was. And so for a long time, this was actually called Station Bray. And stations, well, of course, we've talked about uh, the railways in the past and how there was a great blossoming of visitors. And you've got beautiful hill walking that's, up the glens. Right. So I'm thinking about Sir Walter Scott again and the great writings which stimulated people to come and visit Scotland. And of course, with the railways, it would be easy to access for walking, for golf, for fishing, and things like that. And was it the 1850s and it had its own station? That's right, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. yeah. Crimea uh -huh. had its own station. Yeah. It had its own station right up until 1965 when the under beaching, uh, Karimir was one of the many places that lost the, the railways. But uh, I can I can recall the trains. We had a, a school trip that left from Karimir, <laughs> uh, went to Edinburgh, and uh, the local school was called Reform Street School, which is a street just at the back of us here. Um, but unfortunately, uh, British Rail at that time had uh, put the name of the school on the train as Reform School, so when we arrived on the platform at Edinburgh, uh, the good people of Edinburgh are all scattered. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they need to bring the Israelis back. I mean, we think about the borders line and that, and there's a great call to stimulate communities again uh, by having good um, connections, not just car connections and with green issues as well. And just as you were saying, Dave, there's the Thrums you were talking about. Yeah, the window and Thrums, which was one of J.M. Barry's uh, uh, books then. And again, the name's just preserved in the name of the hotel here. Uh, yeah. Originally, it was a, a dry hotel, but the, there are no dry hotels left in oh, Caribbean yeah. now. <laughs> Thrums, for those wondering, um, was the extra pieces of flax which were left over after the weaving of the linen. Uh, they used to bundle them together in hanks, and uh, that was what was called thrums. So it's very connected with the weaving of linen, which this place was uh, greatly known for in the 19th century especially. Yes, we're now in Bank Street, which is probably the main thoroughfare of the town. Yeah. Uh, and despite it being called Bank Street, uh, as with many Places in Scotland there are now no oh. banks in Bank Street, right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's just a common theme these days. There's the Bank Street Gallery I have exhibited in there years ago, but now uh, what with COVID and things, uh, certain businesses uh, closed and it's going to take them a wee while to reopen again. But it's but gradually coming back. Yeah, we're going up another wee back area. Right. Coming up Bank, Man's Close here. Man's Close. This was the close that the minister would uh, cross from the Man's to the East Church in the centre of the town. And uh, we'll go up here. The, this, uh, in my youth, was a, a, just a very narrow uh, passage uh, up through between gardens. Uh, but uh, you can see the, the Man's, and this was the, the Man's Gate. You can see perhaps the, the lettering still uh, on the, the, the step there. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And that was the, I can't recall the minister's name, but it's now slightly overgrown and dirty. But this is the gate that the minister would have come out to join the public. He wouldn't have walked down the path with the, the great unwashed. <laughs> OK. Well, there you go. There's something else. I've passed this bit so often, and I never was aware there was some lettering on that. So we're coming at a more open area. There was a lot of churches in Kirimuir, Dave, yeah, because uh, with the Free Church of Scotland in the 1820s, the breakaway, uh -huh. which we've talked about then, uh, there was lots. And I think we were talking about it earlier, weren't we, how many churches there that, are. That's right. Yes. I mean, th there were uh, four churches at a crossroads in the town. Uh, the, the main church in the town, uh, in Bank Street, there was another two churches uh, in Bank Street. Uh, it seems an excessive amount of churches for the number of people that lived in the town. Uh, a number of years ago, Kerry Heritage Trust uh, were asked by the council to uh, provide the, the details of Kerry Muir for the tourists. So back in uh, 2011, 10 years ago, we were asked to provide this. So this is some of the wording that I came up with to uh, describe it and some of the points that we've already covered about the name of the town and whether it's Church of St Mary's or Large Hall or Main Quarter. Uh, 
I won't go into details and I won't ask Mike to sing the ball of Kerry Muir. No, 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 I'll be quite <laughs> off, I'd be excited. <laughs> uh, but again, a lot of connections with Barry, uh, Jim Barry, with the camera obscure on the hill, which is too far away for us to go up to see the walk. Bond Scott statue uh, is down at the foot of the brae, mm -hmm. another uh, famous uh, Kerry Marion who uh, went on to uh, rock the world. But uh, the, the Bond Fest is now probably the biggest collection of uh, or gathering of people in the town in normal years. So that was Ronald Scott, Ronald who uh, bon was Scott. Uh, born in Forfa. Uh, well, uh, is you, that right? you say that, but that's yeah. not the family story. Right, uh, okay. His mother did apparently go to the... Um, the maternity home in Forfar, but didn't like it and came home and he was uh, uh, given birth at home in the Roods. <laughs> if so, any of you guys watching are not sure who we're talking about, he was the lead vocalist uh, and he in the hot group ACDC uh, who um, left to go to Australia. His parents emigrated to Australia and I think Dave you've got a wee story about the very young uh, Bon Scott or Ronald Scott um, when again, he was in Kerry Muir with his I, dad. I, yeah. Again, um, his uh, musical ability was never in doubt because uh, his cousin tells me that as a, a four-year-old that uh, uh, Bon would be the first one to follow the Kerry Muir pipe band uh, when they went on parade and would gather up a drum or a tin or anything and follow the pipe band beating the drum behind the, the, the pipe band. So there was never any doubt about his uh, musical heritage. Um, but uh, no one expected him to go on to, to, to world fame. And uh, it surprises many folk that uh, the, the collection of people who arrived to uh, celebrate the, his life in, in Kerry Muir um, every year, uh, apart from this year, obviously. And the name Bon, of course, uh, well, it was a nickname as Bonnie Scott when he went to Australia, but to make it more masculine, they were abbreviated it to Bon Scott. And a tragic uh, death, a very early death, of course, and in London, so. Another uh, three people, uh, or three items that we have here uh, was uh, John Ogilvy, the cartographer uh, of the earliest maps in, in Britain. And he's an amazing chap. Um, he, not only he, did he develop a mapping system, which is basically akin to what we now expect with sat-navs, that you follow a linear route, but they were in a rolled up paper form. So he wasn't interested in if you were going from A to B, uh, city to city, you didn't look at the turnoffs, he marked them, but he didn't uh, name where you would go to. Uh, and he mapped it an inch to a mile, and he produced maps for the whole of England, uh, although he did very little mapping in Scotland. There's the local butcher. It's the only butcher in Kerry Muir, and there's a bit of a wee uh, joke about that. Yes, yes. <laughs> he has he's the OBE, a <laughs> only butcher in... Uh, no, what is it? It's OB, OBK, because... Yeah, um, only butcher in Kerry. Only butcher in Kerry, OBK. yes. So it mentions the mountains over 3,000 feet are known as Monroe's, and they're named after Sir Hugh Monroe, who lived at Lindertis, which is an estate just to the west of Kerry Muir. And the final uh, fact that it quotes here um, is that 25% uh, of Hawaiians of Scottish descent can trace their roots to the area around Kerry Muir as a result of emigration back in the 1880s. So yeah, it's quite I think, a, I think um, that was uh, something to do with the sugar uh, plantations in Hawaii. Th that's right. And, uh, um, but many of them went out as engineers as well. I mean, they, they needed uh, to build the factories and have the skills of the engineers, not not just the growers. Uh, but many of that, and once. Some of the family went, they, they found it was obviously a success, so it encouraged others to follow them. Yeah. We're coming so, up to a, a wall here, which is quite yeah. distinctive, and there's a close behind it, which we'll go into, but I'd like you to take you and show you uh, the base of this wall here. Fortunately, there's not a car parked uh, in front of it, and if we look at the base of the wall, particularly along at this end, if you yeah. look, you'll see a, a very distinctive arch which, oh, yeah, in, I can see which that. indicates yeah. that there was clearly a, a building of some sort below this wall. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, it's suggested that it could possibly go back to Roman times. Um, this is a very distinctive wall, as you can see, and forms a very clear marker. And this was the site of the... Where we are at the moment is the site of the uh, man's garden that I spoke about, the minister coming out the gate. And the building behind us was actually the, the, the man's itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I just love these little kind of accesses, you know, you go through these little um, open doorways and then you're in another uh, another or another pen. We'll look back down the, the cliffs yeah. there. Th this one's got a very unusual name, it's called St Colm's Close. Quite who St Colm was, um, I certainly don't know. Uh, you'll see the, the yeah, old street there. sign yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, we're going to go to one of the oldest businesses in uh, Kerimur. But uh, this is another part of the circuit, this uh, one-way system that uh, you go if you're in a car. It's the police. The former police station here. But again, like banks and post offices, they are a, a bit of history in themselves. Yes, yes. <laughs> the post office, which used to Again, be... closed. Yes. They haven't removed the sign. Uh, the post office itself is, uh, we're all probably familiar with the gold post boxes oh, uh, yeah. following the Olympics, but Kerry Muir has a very unusual post box and it's this beautiful grey granite. Um, I, I'm not aware of any others anywhere in the country that are mm -hmm. made of grey granite, so again, something quite unique to the wee town. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's, and it's great because it's still functioning. It's good yes, to see that... despite uh, the post office being closed, the, yeah. That's still the, the main that's letter posting point. GR, so that's George. Right. Earlier on I spoke about the Ogilvy's being an influence in the town and this is Ogilvy's close that you're looking down now. Right. Um, but we won't go down there, we'll go around to... You can see, there's a, a local framing shop, but as you can see, Bon Some... Scott, ACDC and uh, Peter Pan are the, the main displays here. Mugs and other bits and pieces, uh, all based on the, the fame of uh, uh, J.M. Barry's characters. Yeah. And uh, there was, and uh, we can talk about, we'll probably talk about this later on, but it's Wendy, the name Wendy, uh, who was a character in Peter Pan. Um, it was a accidental name in a way because it was a child's pronunciation of friend, friend or friendly. Yes, Wendy, and yes, then friendly. It was Wendy and then it, it, it came into use and uh, the name Wendy very much associated with uh, Jim Barry and Peter Pan so we've got this uh, old business here as you can see goes back to 1833 Star so, Rock. So this is the, the Star Rock shop here uh, as it says on the sign there, it's the oldest sweet shop in Scotland. Uh, been trading since 1833 continuously. Uh, it has a, a wonderful array of traditional sweets and uh, very popular with the locals and tourists alike, as you might imagine. I believe that uh, J.M. Barry, uh, again the author of Peter Pan, as we've been talking about, uh, was very much uh, associated with the shop and its uh, confectionery and he used to get uh, the rock sent down to London yeah. when, he, when he was in London. So it's got a really, yeah. really interesting history there. Yeah. That's right. Uh, there are many people who have uh, childhood recollections of coming to Kerry Muir on day visits and paying a visit to the Star Rock Shop. And uh, as grandparents, they, they want to pass that uh, interest on to the, their, uh, the grandkids. Uh, so it's still a, a traditional uh, visit that they, they make. Although it's uh, Star Rock, um, the, the one I prefer is actually the cream rock. Cream rock was an, another variant, but it actually was produced at a, a different shop down the street. Uh, they both had their own specialities, uh, but star rock is the one that became famous, although personally I prefer the cream rock. But it's made with real cream, so it's uh, very uh, time sensitive as to when you can uh, get it at the weekends. And uh, they make so it uh, here. And Is all the sweet, right? but most of the sweets that they have in the shop are, are handmade upstairs in the, the little factory. So the Star Rock's actually drawn uh, literally in, in the building, so it's, yeah. it doesn't uh, move very far at all. This is the roots, uh, Dave. Yeah, this is yeah, a very that, the narrow roots. old. Some say it goes the, back to 12th century. Yeah, this uh, main. That's right. Route. There are two parts of the roots, the, the narrow part which leads back to the square where we started the tour and then the wider part which uh, leads to the, to the, up to the glens and up to the North Muir. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the name of the roots, of course, is preserved in the name of the bar alongside us here. Um, but it's uh, pedestrianised now, uh, clearly, as it was quite narrow for bigger uh, local vehicles. Yeah, yeah. Is there any particular reason the bunting is out? Yeah. Uh, again, it was really to try and cheer up the local population because of COVID. It was yeah. really just the uh, locals got together and made the, the bunting and hoped to uh, be able to bring a wee bit of lightness to the town. Yeah. Which uh, really was uh, That's a nice idea. struggling yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. Would you go and have a wee look in the sweetie shop? I'll put my light on. There we go. Right. Yeah. No, no, we're just, we're just having a quick look at the sweets here, but as you can see, it's school time, so the children are really busy trying to collect their, their weekly stock. But we'll give you a, a wee example of the, the different types of sweets yeah. that uh, are in the shop. This is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is Liz uh, Crosley, who Hello. Uh, is the owner of the current owner of the Starry Rock shop. But uh, uh -huh. we we know the history of the, the shop yeah, uh, yeah. over the just years. Just have a quick look. We don't and want to stop your customers coming in. Well, 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 you, yeah, yeah. 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 Carry on. <laughs> And they've got really special things here that you wouldn't be able to get anywhere else. And I'm just looking, it is just so tempting in here. But I'll resist the temptation at the moment. <laughs> it's just wonderful things. Uh -huh. And the rock itself is. Uh, the star, star rock's behind you in the tree there. The star rock. Oh, that's it there. That's a star rock. So we're going to. We're going to make our way, I think, along now to J.M. Barry's uh, birthplace uh, and have a little look in there. And, uh, but we've got various people connected with Kerry Muir. Up in the windows there, you can see Bon Scott again. At one point, uh, Dave, there was a picture of David Niven, but I see it since been taken down. That's right. Because well, he said he claimed... It was David Niven's claim. It, it, many people thought it was the people of Kerry Muir who were trying to claim some of his fame, but we, we don't know why he claimed to have been uh, a Kerry Marion. Um, th there seems to be no connections whatsoever, but uh, it, it certainly did the town no harm to have uh, someone as famous as David Niven claiming to have come from the town. I believe he was born in Belgravia yes. in London, but he did have strong connections uh, with Scotland. I think his wife was Scottish. Yes, I. First wife, anyway. But uh, yeah. no, we've no real record of any direct connection with the, with the town. Yeah. There's a police station uh, from further across the street. We just passed it earlier on. Again, there's a lot of uh, local crafts on sale here. You can see the local stick oh, yeah, yeah. crook makers and that that sell their wares here. Yeah, and again, this being a good uh, starting place or finishing place for going on hill walks, uh, you've got some walking sticks in there. Uh, Cromachs or big yes. long sticks uh, uh -huh. that uh, would help you on your way. Yeah, if you're going back to say about the 12th, 13th century, then we were talking about the shift in populations. There wasn't big towns, there was more like people living in the country, and this would be more a, a meeting place, although it was quite a small place as well. It, for, for folk, yeah. The, the town's situated at the bottom of the glens. I mean, uh, the, I mean, lo the, it's locally known as the Wee Red Town. It's also known as the gateway to the glens uh, because it, so many of the glens just lead uh, off from Kerry Muir, whether it be uh, Glen Isla uh, in the west through to Glen Prosen and Glen Clover, uh, right through uh, Glen Ogle and Glen Moy and many, many of the smaller glens. So. Uh, there were many Polish soldiers uh, stationed here uh, during the war and they lived in the, uh, the town hall here um, and in the school and many other buildings in the town. Uh, it was used as a training base uh, for an engineer group and uh, there are many stories of uh, uh, local girls being involved with the Polish soldiers and uh, many, so there are many uh, Polish names still in the town and there is a, a plaque there uh, about four years ago, a, a, a Polish um, uh, society came across that were 
uh, trying to find out where the Poles had been during the war. And uh, below the, the little memento, you can see there's a hole drilled in the stonework, and there's actually a, a time capsule slipped oh. in into that hole right. that was left by the, by the Polish soldiers. My goodness. Right, right, I see it there. Uh, and, well, as I said, it was uh, repainted by a couple of local chaps a few years back because it was becoming, the paint work was just becoming a bit faded. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's quite an amazing building, this, isn't it? It's uh, the library on one side and the town hall uh, on the other. And there's yeah. a, a plaque to Charles Melvin, Kerry's uh, VC. Um, we had three VCs, so Kerry Muir, for a small population, are, are quite unusual in having three VCs. Um, but uh, that's the Charles Melvin, who is a, a local character. Uh, James M. Barry, uh, who didn't just write Peter Pan, he was a playwright, dramatist, he was also, uh, well, as we know, a, a great novelist. He wrote The Admiral Crichton, uh, was one of his... Uh, dramatizations and also the little minister and we've got associations with glams in the little minister and that's the two we're going to be doing on wednesday uh, with joe uh, when we'll be uh, having a wander through the village of glams and here we come to jm barry's birthplace now this is open it's a national trust for scotland and uh, if you're coming to kerry muir it's a must really um, so we're going to have a look. He was born here in 1860. He was one of ten children. His uh, older brother died tragically in a skating accident. And hence the name, of course, of Peter Pan and the boy who never grew up. And uh, tragic tale, at the age of 14, his older brother died. So... I'm just going to excuse us as shortly we are going into interiors and we'll don our face masks. But before we do that, we're going to have a little look. look. I don't know if uh, we'll put the, the light here. on here and have a look in the wash house. Uh, the wash house is really pretty much as it would have been in Barry's day. You've got the, the, the fireplace here where they would have burnt the coal to heat the copper, which is still in situ. You would have done your washing in this... Uh, uh, cast uh, bowl here. Uh, there's a plunger which you would have used to uh, 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 get your soap uh, through your clothing, and obviously a scrubbing boards at the at the back here. And uh, as you took the clothing out, you would then put it through the the traditional mangle, which would uh, squeeze the the clothes, uh, and uh, the water would run out. Uh, and then you would put it in your baskets and take it out and hang it on a drying green. So it's very much as it uh, was uh, in the days of Barry. And this was a theatre as well, wasn't it? He this was where, I mean, because it? Barry lived uh, in the house, the wash house was really effectively, as a, uh, any child's imagination and play area, this was his theatre um, where he could write his plays and ask his uh, friends and family to perform. Um, I mean, many children have great imaginations and do that still to this day, but, uh, I mean, this, this was uh, clearly a, a significant place in his uh, imagination. And as you can see, it's just close to the, the door of his house. This is a real privilege. We're going to have a little look here uh, inside uh, James birth, Barry's birthplace. And uh, we've got Caroline, who works here. And... Uh, so we'll put the little light on so we can get a little view in here. And this would have been the ground floor where the weaving would have been happening. Um, and upstairs was the domestic area where we have got the bedrooms and the kitchen up above. Um, so we have got artefacts, of course, now dating uh, a personal belongings to J.M. Barry, like his desk here, as we can see. If you want to say something about that. Uh. So this is a partner desk, which means that this side you can use, but it comes out at the other side as well. So you could have somebody working at the other side. You'll see that it's the leather work, if you can see that. It's quite well worn both sides. Barry was actually left-handed, but was forced to write with his right hand, as was the 
way at that time because they thought that the left hand was the devil's hand. So everybody was forced to write with their right hand. And um, later on he got arthritis in his hand, in his right hand, so he was able to revert and use his left hand. And he used to say he wrote more sinister plots with his left hand. Sinistra being, of course, left in, in Italian or Latin. So that was, that was part of it. We've got photographs of him on the top here too. And there's some, something about scrapings, Caroline, on the leather that says something about his cufflinks or well, something. Well, this is right. Been, that's what it yeah. would have been when yeah, he was yeah. using, but that's why it's kind of worn on both sides, as I say, because he used his right hand until he was forced by this arthritis to to use the left mm -hmm, hand. And mm -hmm. Even then, I suppose, he would have rested his arm there and therefore scuffed it, as you say. Um, up. And we've got a, co a copy of his, well, typewritten manuscript for Peter Pan here. And we've got one of the old copies of A Window in Thrums. And Thrums, of course, I'm sure you already know, is the, the name yeah. he used for Kitty Muir. And he wrote this book called A Window in Thrums about characters in Kitty Muir that he knew as he was growing up. Um, well, he based them on people he knew. They weren't that enamoured um, <laughs> to start with. They thought he was um, making a fool of them, but actually it was his real fondness for Kiri Muir and its occupants that led him to, to write the book. <clears throat> I believe the sink stand uh, belonged to his father, was that right? Yes, yes. I don't yeah. know if he gifted it to his father. It's a possibility. And then there's one, another one to the left there. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. Yes, with it? the yeah. mother of Pearl, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and that was for his sister-in-law as a wedding present. So that maybe was Alexander's wife, I think, because... Well, it's the only sister-in-law he could have had. The only others would have all been brother-in-laws for his um, siblings. <coughs> the windows are very small. Uh, well, certainly at that size. But I was wondering uh, for getting light, because traditionally, if it was a weaving uh, place, they would have bigger windows. But maybe this was it on this side it's where they would true. be getting the. Yeah. If you look from the, at the property from outside, you'll see that both the, the, the downstairs windows of number nine are larger than the next door neighbour's house, number 11. And that was because, as you say, they needed the light for weaving, but also once the bale of cloth was made, they could push it out through the window onto a barrow. Obviously, somebody else was going to be helping. And then it was taken round to what is now the gateway to the Glens Museum and had to be inspected yes, and quality stamped. And if it wasn't up to scratch, they would throw it out over the cobbles in the square. So their work would have been for no reason at all. It was tough, tough justice, I suppose you could say, but it did keep a quality assurance going and um, it made sure that the weavers who did do quality work would get paid the correct sum as well. So it's pros and cons. A wee, a wee bit quick history, uh, just to give you a little quick history about Jim Barry. He was uh, born here uh, up the stairs and uh, he went to Edinburgh University, but he, he, he went to school in Dunfries. So he wasn't always just in Kerry Muir, but he kept coming back to Kerry Muir. And he wrote for a newspaper. He was a journalist and he started writing a tale like window and thrums and various other tales that he'd maybe heard on his mother's knee and um, that was the start of uh, a big role into being very famous and uh, much read. The, the, this really is quite amazing, this uh, little chest because uh, I believe this was, uh, as a young man he used to haul this about. Well, uh, he was he that took right? it down to London, you mentioned he was a journalist, he was a journalist on the Nottingham Journal which collapsed and he was one of the last to be employed so he was one of the first to be let go so he came home but then decided that he should go to London if he was ever going to make his fortune so he packed up his worldly possessions in this chest and this is what he took down to London with him so traveling light I suppose you could say but uh, mm -hmm. that was it and 12 pounds I think it was in his pocket and that was him. But then, of course, £12 in those days would be quite a lot of money. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll take you much further. Yeah. Um, I think we've got uh, a, a question. Is the grand, it's a question about the grandfather clock. Somebody's asking if it's, yeah. if it's quite old. I don't know if it's a grandfather or a long case clock, but um, 
it's got the words of Kilimur on the right hand side spelt differently I think it might be Kilimur because there were 32 different spellings of Kilimur at one stage um, but you'll see the maker's name is Bauer on the left hand side there the writing is different because the clock faces were made elsewhere and then sent out to various towns and then a cabinet maker would make the clock casing to go with the face and that's why it's uh, got the different writing on it so the clock maker would be one and then the cabinet maker would have probably written Kiri Muir in and um, it's a very nice motifs on it though very sort of child like or child friendly motifs if you like so quite appropriate to hear but I don't think it was part of the family's possessions originally it's just of the time and um, obviously belongs to Kiri so that's why it's quite appropriate that it's here. I, I see these photographs of Caroline on the wall and uh, yeah. I believe that is uh, him with, with his, his, his wife yeah. um, but he would you like to say something about her? I don't think he had any children, did he? No. 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 His, um, he married this lady called Mary Ansell, who I think is very pretty. There's not very many photographs of her. There was one or two. Um, but she really is a, a lovely looking lady. She was an actress, which is why he met her, obviously, in the theatre when he was doing his plays and so on. And um, she followed him up to Scotland when he had a bout of ill health. And they got married in Kirimuir at another property called Strathview. I don't know if you've been down, no, haven't been down to that, but it's in the south of the town, opposite a window in Thrums that I've already mentioned. Uh, and uh, he, they were married in um, 1894 and they divorced in 1909. She found herself um, a toy boy, 20 years her junior, called Gilbert Cannon or Canaan. <laughs> and he was a, uh, in the legal profession and the writers at that time were meeting in each other's houses to discuss censorship. They were trying to get censorship taken away so that the, obviously that they could write freely about everything and at one of these meetings uh, Gilbert Cainan took the, mi the minutes of all the meetings so obviously Mary met him when it was Barry's turn to host and uh, she started an affair with him Barry discovered this from the gardener at Black Lake Cottage, which they had down near Farnham, Frensham. And uh, so they got divorced in 1909. That was also the year he was offered a knighthood, and he declined the knighthood, either because he didn't want the publicity with the same time as the divorce was going through, which would have been quite painful anyway, or maybe he didn't want Mary to get the title of Lady Barry but um, nevertheless by not taking his knighthood in 1909 in 1913 he was created a baronet which is one up <laughs> they didn't have family and um, there's talk it's it's alluded to but not definitely that perhaps the marriage was never consummated he tended to put women on a pedestal and uh, I think that made life a bit difficult um, for relationships. Um, I think a lot of people will be familiar with the Johnny Depp movie yeah. uh, as well. And I'm, I'm just looking around here and I can see some pictures of the Llewellyn uh, boys who yes. were uh, very close friends to Jim Barry. And of course, we've got one of them uh, dressed up. As Peter Pan, and he met them in Kensington Gardens in London. Yeah, it, yeah, indeed. Uh, yeah, the Llewellyn Davis boys, his parents Sylvia and Arthur. Arthur sadly died in 1907, and Sylvia mm, a few years later, possibly 1911, 1912. So that left the family uh, of boys, five boys, with no proper, well, no parent. Barry assumed guardianship. I think it was intended by Sylvia that possibly the nanny should take the role of looking after the boys, which she would have continued to do anyway, but Barry sort of, I would say, muscled in there, but he decided that he was going to see to their education and make sure they had a roof over their head and um, food on the table. So he he took this role, and they were his his family, I suppose you would say became his family. And as you say, he wrote Peter Pan for them. One of the boys was called Peter.
that two of them died in sad circumstances. George was killed in the First World War, and Michael died in a, a, a boating accident. Um, it's possible it was a suicide. And Nico was the only one that lived to a really good age of 77, which is actually the same age that Barry lived to, which is quite a coincidence there. But the others died a bit younger. <clears throat> Again, one of the others may have committed suicide as well. So it's all lots of tragedy. Yeah, and uh, he did come back to visit his uh, birthplace, and he, he, he did always keep contact with Kevin Muir, Indeed. which was good. And uh, he, which I think is a great thing, the rights, uh, whenever Peter Pan is uh, performed, the rights from the play go to the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital yes, great in London, hospital, which I think mm -hmm. says an awful lot for him as well. And he is uh, buried here in the Hill Cemetery as well, so he had a great, uh, even after all these years, he still had that uh, connection with coming back here. His, yeah. root, his roots were very firmly Kirimia. Definitely, yep. and he writes a, a piece of forward in one of the books, and it's just all about everything's talking about the different places in Kirimur and really alluding to the kind of things that he used to get up to as a child, where he played and the fun that they had and the tricks that they got up to and so on. So it's very fondly remembered by him, Kiri, and he was back for funerals of parents and that kind of thing. As I say, he was married here, so born here, married here, buried here. And uh, that was, I think that really does tell the story of it. No, that's great, thank you very much. I'd just like to say something about this uh, attraction. It is open. I'll get Carol in a minute to give you a bit more detail about if you're wanting to come and visit here mm -hmm. when it's open. It's a great place to see. We've uh, just come into the bottom floor, but there's uh, quite a lot more to see uh, up the stairs as well. Um, so, just in terms of uh, access, opening times, uh, you're part of the National Trust for Scotland, of course. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, so we're open on a Saturday and Sunday at the moment until the end of October from 10.30 till 4.30, but last admission is 4 o'clock. Um, and I'm often here on, well, I am always here on a Monday, so I often let visitors in if they happen to be passing on a Monday morning as well. So. Um, but officially it's Saturday and Sunday, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. I'm just drawing this to close now. I'd just like to say thank you very much to Caroline. And th we, we, we're going to, before we finish, we're just going to take a little walk out into the garden. And we're going to go over to this, uh, this garden. And this is a Strath View, which was much, hasn't changed very much from the time that uh, Barry was here, getting a little view of the, the house there that we've just been in. Very significant TikToks garden. I think this is just uh, totally amazing. Of course, if you're familiar with Peter Pan, you'll know uh, the crocodile story. And uh, this crocodile who was always stalking Captain Hook. And it's a real metaphor for the passage of time with the tick-tock of the ticking clock. Um, and this is, uh, I'm not sure what sort of wood, the wood isn't local wood, but it's uh, quite amazing the way the grain of the wood is incorporated into the, the design of the crocodile. I think that's pretty fantastic. It's driftwood. Yeah. Yeah, claws are metal and the rest of it is driftwood. Wow. Okay, so thanks very much again for watching.